Kia ora, I'm Andre Mazzetto, uh, Life Cycle assessment, assessment Scientist at Ag Research, and I'm here today to present to you the review that we've done in association with Dairy NZ about the carbon footprint of milk for of dairy cows in different countries of the world. So the goal of this research or this review was to have a reliable and a robust comparison of the carbon footprint of milk production uh, between different countries. And there are several challenges uh, when performing uh, such uh, review. Mainly, they are related to the boundaries of the study, uh, studies having a representative number of farms, and also the standard factors that are calculated that needs to be done in a systematic way. So I'm going uh, quickly over these three uh, challenges, starting with the boundaries. Normal the carbon, normally, the carbon footprint is done by the calculation of a, by the uh, life cycle assessment uh, methodology, which considers the whole uh, life cycle of a product, in this case, the milk or the red boundary that you can uh, see. Uh, the fact uh, that we know is from previous research that most of the impacts, most of the emissions are up to the farm gate. So this blue dashed boundary is the what we call cradle to farm gate uh, was the boundary that we chose. And most of the studies are also uh, published at, at that boundary. The second one was to have a representative number of farms. Uh, since life cycle assessment is um, very data hungry, and the laborious process takes a lot of time. Mostly, most of the studies published at uh, the milk production, they are usually comparing two different managements, like organic versus conventional milk or pasture based versus feedlot. And that's not representative of the country uh, footprint of the country production. So what we've done, and that was our first uh, cutoff criteria, was uh, to check if the study had uh, was performed at a country level and had more than 100 farms. If no, uh, if it was like, for example, a regional study, we check it if that region uh, represented a, a good proportion of the milk production for the country. For example, we had studies in Italy with less than 100 farms, but the region studied uh, represented almost 75 to 80% of the milk of the country. So we decided to include uh, the, those studies. And the last one are standard factors. Uh, they are calculated in um, different life cycle assessment studies, and they could be different. Uh, for example, the three uh, that we assessed were the global warming potential, that is the way that is conventional for transforming the three different gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide in one standard called CO2 equivalent. And as you can see in the table, there are different numbers for each one, depending on the year of the publication of the assessment reports, the IAR on the tables. And we chose 2007 because it, was, it is the one that is mostly used on the papers that we found. The second one is the functional unit, as we call. Um, the footprint is nothing more than the total emissions of the farm divided by something. And this something can be, in the case of milk, uh, liters of production, kilograms. And we chose fat and protein corrected milk because it is the one that is recommended uh, from the International Dairy Federation. And also, it accounts for the different breeds. So we have different breeds. You put all of the production in one uh, standard. And the last one are the practice for allocation between milk and beef. As uh, dairy farms, they produce beef as well, not just milk. We have to allocate emissions between these two products. And there are several, again, the same as a function un unit, several ways to allocate. Uh, we chose the biophysical allocation because again, is the recommended one by the IDF and is the one that is being used uh, most recently. 
So this is the final flow diagram. And as you can see, you have more, uh, you have access to the reports and there's more detail there. Uh, when a study uh, didn't follow, like for example, if they were not using FPCM as the unit, we try to find data on the paper to recalculate the footprint. If the data wasn't there, we got in touch with the authors asking for supplementary data in order to add uh, more papers to the review. Uh, our initial search resulted in 86 papers, and after going through that flow diagram that was shown in the previous slide, we ended up with 24 papers and a good geographical uh, distribution all over the world, at least one paper uh, per continent. And the final results uh, are shown in this figure, and there's several things to unpack here. Those are the recalculated footprints, considering all the differences between the studies. And we see that New Zealand is at the bottom with the lowest carbon footprint on 0.74 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per fat and protein corrected milk. And something else you notice is that you have different colors of the bars, the blue bars and the red ones. When we were performing the recalculation, we noticed that the allocation factor was the main one that was uh, driving the results. So the red bars represent uh, the studies that use the biophysical allocation. So we didn't have to recalculate the allocation for those studies. And you have a more direct comparison. In the report, we uh, extend this analysis and show the differences between when, when you are using energy as a allocation and change it to biophysical or when you're using economic change it to biophysical, the impact that had in the recalculation. And the third thing you will notice that Australia, Portugal, and New Zealand are marked as hashes bar. And though in those countries, they are using their national inventory and mostly uh, region specific emission factors for, recalcula for calculating the footprint. And why is that important? First of all, uh, emission factors, they are, coefficients that allow us to convert activity data into greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, if you have the amount of fertilizer you apply on the soil, we have different emission factors for different fertilizers and we can convert this in emissions and use for the footprint. The International Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, suggests uh, the full emission factors when you don't have specific ones. But the same IPCC also recommends if you have specific factors for your region, for your country, you should be using it. The problem is that it takes a long time and a lot of effort and re years of research to develop those factors. And we have here in New Zealand researchers that dedicated their career to one topic, and now we can use those uh, factors. And that's a layer that we couldn't access on the report because some authors are very diligent and they report everything that they use, it, all the factors, others not so much. So just to show you uh, the impact of using specific versus default factors, what we've done was to access the latest uh, study in the New Zealand that by Stuart Ledgard from AgriSearch. And you have on the left uh, the New Zealand using the footprint or 0 0.74 using the specific emission factors for New Zealand. And on the right bar, you see when you go, if New Zealand didn't have any specific factors, if we had to use all the default factors from IPCC. So we see that a uh, big impact on the blue bar, which represents the nitrous oxide from excreta almost three times, but also the difference big difference on the green bar, that is the enteric fermentation. Another factor that uh, needs to be uh, considered is the land use change. Uh, land use change, the emissions from land use change occur, for example, when you convert a land from forestry to pasture. And according to the latest paper from uh, Dr. Ledgard, it adds 0 0.14 kilograms of CO2 equivalent of per kilogram of FPCM to the New Zealand 
emissions. So we move from 0 0.74 to 0 0.88. But this is based on the land use change at the sector level, at the dairy sector. If the countries, and none of the paper reported land use change, um, the emissions from land use change, if they were going to do that, they would probably rely on national statistics. And if we do that in New Zealand, that purple bar will become zero. And the net result for land use change will be nil because it happened, afforestation happened over the last 25 years in New Zealand. So the value would come back to uh, 0 0.74. Another uh, important part of the research and that is being suggested lately is that different greenhouse gases would have different impacts and the global warming potential that table showed before uh, should be considering the long term and the short term greenhouse gases. So very briefly, um, the example is you see here what we call the short carbon cycle or the short term when you have the for example, the, CO, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is captured by the pasture in the process that we all quite know well from the school, the photosynthesis. The cow will eat this pasture, will transform it in meat and milk, but there are some inefficiencies on the, on the process, and the cow will emit methane through the enteric fermentation. That methane will go to the atmosphere, and after about 20 years, it will be reconverted to CO2, and then we come back full circle on this short term cycle that lasts from 20 to 30 years. And that's quite different from when we drill a hole in the ground, we extract the fossil fuels, we burn the fossil fuels, and we put that carbon that was locked on under the soil to back to the atmosphere. And yes, eventually this carbon will come back to the soil, but that will take thousands, maybe millions of years. And that's the long cycle. So new research has been uh, done and suggesting new metrics saying that methane should be considered, we should consider this difference between the, the cycles uh, of the carbon. So what we've done here was to represent the same results as that previous uh, first uh, figure, but now looking at the, you have on the vertical axis, the carbon footprint, and then on the horizontal, the milk production. And instead of putting dots, what we've done was to create small pie charts where you can see the distribution of the three different gases, uh, methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide among the different countries. And that's really a really important uh, part. So I'll take you step by step. Uh, first, looking at this group of countries here on the bottom corner, you see that they have a footprint looking at the vertical axis between one and two and uh, high production per cow. And those are mostly um, European countries plus the United States and Canada. And what we see when we look at the uh, profile of the greenhouse gases is that if you look at USA and Netherlands, you see almost an even distribution between the three gases or methane is kind of less than 50%, a bit more 55% of the total footprint. This is because uh, during winter, these countries, they have to house the animals and deal with the manure management, which increased the green one, the nitrous oxide emissions, and also buying in feed, which increased the CO2, the red. And that's really different when you look at the other side of the spectrum. For these countries, they are mostly developing countries that have a high footprint between two and three and a low to average milk production. And it's quite remarkable the difference. You see that most of the emissions from 75 to 85 percent is basically methane. That's because those pastures rely, those countries rely a lot on pasture as the main feeding, and most of the emissions are related to the animal, no longer to buying the feed or treating the manure. And in the middle, you have a 
different group of countries. And if we look for the ones that are under one on the carbon footprint, you find the usual suspects, New Zealand, Australia, Uruguay, and Ireland. And what we see, what we know is that those countries, they have a good pasture management um, and they are known for the for taking good care of the animals as well. So we see that uh, most of the carbon footprint is related to the methane as well, the blue. And you see the difference, uh, the effect of the winter in Ireland with more green and more red than uh, compared with the other ones. So the main conclusions of our study are that the New Zealand showed the lowest carbon footprint on 0.74 kilograms of CO2, and that would change to 0.88 if you consider the land use change. The allocation method was the key method on the footprint calculation. Region-specific emission factors are usually connected to uh, lower footprints, and that's important because countries are developing new research and probably their numbers will go down in the future. And also countries show different greenhouse gas profiles as the pie charts uh, before. So, and that's re really relevant when we are considering these new metrics of, especially for the methane. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to get any questions or comments uh, via email. Thank you.